trickle in. But yeah, it's fine. I guess we're Stop that. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, our next speaker, we are really excited about. I've been trying to get Jackie Grebmeyer here for six years, and normally uh, at this time of the year, she's a thousand miles above the Arctic Circle, uh, doing what she's been doing uh, for the past 30 years in the Arctic. So we thought she was the ideal person uh, to bring in to talk about the Pacific Arctic region, a window into shifting benthic populations in response to ecosystem change. Thank you, Jeremy. And I want to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to be here and for you to come back from coffee break. So I, I would like to acknowledge uh, these are some, only few of the many co-authors, because this is a time series over a very long period, and it also is international. So with that, I'll, I'll explain that towards the end. But first of all, uh, just to set the stage, the very basic part of this ecological principle has been in this region is that it's very shallow. This is in the Bering and Chukchi Sea in the Pacific sector is a highly productive system, but it's variable regionally because it's a very much of an advective system. And, it, and with that has been a tight pelagic benthic coupling. So the, the original paradigm has been that, in fact, we have uh, it's a benthic dominated system. And, and saying past is it's still going on, but it looks like in certain regions we're moving into transition. And so the extreme is that it would move into more of a fully pelagic system. But because it's ranging from 30 to 60 meters in depth, it's a shallow continental shelf. So in the spring, and you go from south to north, ice algal production, while the sea ice is still there, the, the snow melts off, and you get uh, a penetration of sunlight, you get ice algae, and then as it opens up, phytoplankton. And most of that is going down to the benthos. The zooplankton have yet to gone through, go through their uh, life stages. And so what that's made is a prey base for diving sea ducks, uh, diving marine mammals, walruses, and demersal fish. And in the future, and this has been a, mod a graphic that's been modified and came out in Sue Moore's uh, uh, Phil Stabenow SOAR issue, and you've heard about that, the synthesis of Arctic research, uh, NOAA and Bohm funded uh, synthesis effort by a group of multiple scientists, is that the system will be more like, the, for example, uh, regions of the southern Bering Sea or more open subarctic systems, a lot of open water production, and most of that will be shunted into the zooplankton, less to the benthos, and more into this, these water column feeding animals. So as, as a benthic ecologist and a benthic biological oceanographer, a lot of the uh, animals I'm looking at are clams. We had those last night. Polychaetes, you don't normally eat those. Cypunculas, amphipods, but they're big food prey for these large megafauna that people think of for the high Arctic, big whales and, and walruses. So the key points of the presentation I'd like to cover, and, and, and it's been a nice uh, ramp up with the uh, uh, color, Arctic color program presentation. We are seeing decreasing sea ice extent and the duration. On the, on the Arctic, uh, seasonal warming is common, the bottom water. And when I show you some, some of the images, you'll be able to track some of that water temperatures as we move from south to north. We are seeing change in prey concentration and some northward movement of three of the core longest decadal time series uh, biomass we have for the benthic fauna. So we have these decadal time series studies that have been going on. And I'd like to uh, include it in this presentation are the repeat sampling we've had as part of our uh, looking at ecosystem status and trends for the distributed biological observatory. So I think you all probably know this, but just briefly, it's a highly evective system. We have Pacific water coming in, nutrient-rich on the western side through Bering Strait, Russia on this side, Alaska uh, and Canada over towards the east. And then we have the, what's called the Alaska coastal water. So we have this fresh water coming in. One, the, uh, this area is seasonally ice covered. So when spring starts to happen, which is like uh, the ice starts to pull back, this is ice covered with first year ice. It moves back on a latitudinal basis until this whole area is ice covered, ice free basically by September. So we are, there's latitudinal warming just normally because that Pacific water is pumping in warmer water than the Arctic. So what we have here is that this is a composite over a decade, just the last decade of bottom water temperatures. And this is set up seasonally. So in the winter, it's minus 1.7 all the way through. Your stratification is zero. And then as you build up uh, warming in the springtime and into the summer, you get this Alaska coastal water. This is the warm temperatures up by over 10 degrees Celsius 
Where is down here? This is what we call our St. Lawrence Island Polinia region. This is staying cold below zero all summer long, and it's not until stratification is broken down that you actually get, uh, uh, you break down that stratification in the fall. So I'm just gonna bounce you through this because one of the things we built in this observatory is to go from south to north as you track the sea ice retreat and what that has as an impact on the system. I would just point out that it's, as I said, high nutrients on the western side, but also that, the, as was mentioned earlier, there's a freshening and an increased volume of this uh, uh, fresher water on the eastern side of the system. So as part of the SOAR activity, we have four decades of studies. There are 17, 18 people total on the synthesis activity. And this is just the benthic biomass uh, uh, hotspot areas you can see in the bright red. And what you're seeing is the regions in the area where you have deposition zones. So as the evective system, as production goes on, the system that is underneath it isn't necessarily, it's partly fed by production that time of year, but a lot of it is from upstream production. So you get this conveyor belt of carbon coming through the system. And you can really see the buildup, most of the sampling until the 2000 period was from the southern part of the Chukchi Sea and southward, and that was due to ice and our capability to work in that region. And then as you move into this area, this is the time about 2006 and 7, we had ocean exploration uh, by oil and gas development, so shale oil was in this area, and with that became our counterpart on government funding and access via the vessels, icebreakers like the, the Healy and the Polar Sea, Polar Star, and then later on the season, open water vessels. So this really built up our sampling, but the time series is really in here. This is where we have two to three decades of data, and then we're beginning to start to build that up in that region. So the big benthic foragers, as I mentioned, we have uh, diving sea ducks in the south of St. Lawrence Island. They're feeding off of clams. We have the uh, Pacific walrus that's moving further northward and staying longer up in the and offshore in the uh, Chukchi Sea, and diving gray whales that are feeding not only on traditionally on these amphipods, but also on euphosids. So they're able to switch hit and take advantage of both types of prey source. So as part of this, uh, uh, we have a, a program called the uh, Distributed Biological Observatory, and the strength on this uh, allowing us to occupy these stations with multiple ships from other countries and our own. So this particular program, our base funding from NSF, is to occupy with our Canadian colleagues every year, every July, off by one day. And I've been doing this since 98, up through <coughs> one, two, three, four, five. And we pick these areas as hot spots uh, on transect lines, so they go across water masses to uh, look at the latitudinal pullback of sea ice and the impact that has on the uh, ecological buildup of the system, export production to the underlying sediments. These are areas of high productivity, biodiversity, or ones we've seen rates of change. So we're using this as a change detection array because the benthic animals in fauna are staying in one place and they're adapting to what is coming down from the overlying water column. So the, the plankton and the phenology is changing and the zooplankton, and that's being evicted northward. And then it's occupied right now. We have six countries at various times of the year. We work on a standard metafile. I'm not going to go into details. I can answer that later. But we have this data sets. Uh, we have various agencies involved from NOAA, BOEM, uh, NASA. And I'll just briefly mention some of that because it feeds into how we're understanding the system. So as part of this observatory, we, we decided internationally these were basic measurements uh, that were at the minimum to be collected as much as we can on these lines. So TNS, current speed. Uh, we look at chlorophyll nutrients, abundance in biomass, biodiversity of algal production, zooplankton, and benthos, and uh, both infauna and epifauna. And then periodically, particularly with uh, uh, NOAA involvement on the fish, we look at sediment parameters, seabirds, and marine mammals. So we have a collaboration with US Fish and Wildlife Service, who put seabird observers on the cruises, uh, and then marine mammal surveys. We also have moorings, and this is a big international effort. There are moorings in every one of these uh, sites. Uh, two of them are by our Japanese colleagues, and the other three are by uh, US uh, lead PIs. And then we have satellite data that we interact with, uh, with the PIs as well as uh, with our NASA colleagues. 
So just one example, uh, you can go to these websites, uh, their contribution, Joey Camiso is in charge of that. It's the every two weeks putting together, uh, be it sea ice or on this one is just surface pressure, and then uh, identifying primary uh, chlorophyll standing stocks. Then he's, they've got loops and they're actually looking at uh, time series related to uh, values that have occurred in, in past years. And then these are available so you can talk to, uh, contact Joey to access all of that information. I would just point out what you're seeing up here, the DBO, it's a collaborative team. So within the Arctic community that's under the Obama's White House, the Interagency Arctic Research and Policy Committee, there are 12 teams. Uh, we have a five-year plan that went for 2012 to 17. New ones in progress is out actually on the street if you want to comment on it. But for the DBO, we have a collaborative team. Uh, uh, Sue Moore is the chair. I co-chair that. And these are the organizations that are involved. NSF has one of the programs under the Observing Network, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, put out crews. They occupy these lines. We share those data. Uh, Alaska Ocean Observing System uh, has a, actually a part of their mooring array here. Uh, we also have a, a, academic partners and then uh, NOAA in there. And then on top, and NASA. And on top of this, we have the Pacific Arctic Group, which is our international uh, connection. So the trends that we're seeing, uh, and that's why we base these lines, most of the talk will be about the one through five, because the newest thing we've done in the last year is to move it into the Beaufort Sea, but there are fewer ships that cross that on an annual basis. We have up to 15 ships that are moving in, many to work up in the high Arctic, and we have an agreement to occupy one to five of all of these lines. But what you're seeing is on the south, so you're looking here at DBO1, we actually have had a growth of sea ice the first year, so there's no statistically different uh, concentration there, but there's a plenty of there. So you're making ice that you're always having in an open area in the uh, late winter period. But as you start moving up into the Chukchi Sea, and so we're relating the retreat of sea ice uh, on the ecological parameters, and the persistence is less. So we're, it's leaving earlier and coming back later. So on our annual cruises that we do uh, in collaboration with our Canadian colleagues, we go out on the Laurier, we run from Dutch Harbor to Barrow in 10 days and are occupying these five lines, which is also particularly DBO three and five are what our international colleagues are looking at. And then we are uh, doing a variety of those parameters that I mentioned to you. And just one example, so we look at, uh, this is the integrated chlorophyll blowout of this DBO3. I point this out because it's just north of Bering Strait, and we're seeing a, a change in that. And we're also seeing here, this is going from offshore, which is high diatom, to uh, dinoflagellates in the Alaska coastal water. So looking at species composition is of the phytoplankton, this is done with our Polish colleagues, actually. But I would point this out that with our Japanese colleagues, they're using satellite data to look at species composition and are working at how that would be changing with the warming that's going through on these persistence of these hot spots in that particular area where they also maintain a mooring. Uh, an example for the same year is in our, in our collaboration uh, between uh, uh, Noah Bohm and, the Sh and Shell Oil when they were still there last year and this year, but we didn't have a cruise this year was to, you'll see we've embedded the DBO lines. So the ideal is to have these standard lines that we're occupying seasonally with moorings and satellites and process cruises. And so we've had three data meetings so far and have a special issue of about 30 papers coming out in deep sea research uh, by next year, but all papers are going in this fall. And what you're basically seeing here, so you have the rich anadir water. This is where the carbon is, is produced. A lot of it's dropping down and that's what's gonna maintain the rest of the talk which is all on the benthos. And you see the same thing. By the time we get out there in July, up in the north, in this region here, most of that nutrients, they're on the bottom. But this actually turns over with storms, and you can get production going on in this region throughout the summer. And this is just one example of the moorings. And the reason I put this out there, this is working with uh, uh, Shige Nishino and Takashi uh, Kikuchi from Jamstack in Japan, is that they're actually finding fall blooms. And one of the things that we're seeing with the fall blooms is they're becoming more regular. And one of the things we've asked with NASA is to actually start processing beyond the closure time of October because this is when we're seeing the bump up of fall blooms. 
And what happens is that it, we're relating, they have oxygen sensors, and you can see the turbidity. All of these factors have an influence on the persistence of these benthic hotspots. And that, now, I just wanted to point out, because we have our final mooring coming in on DBO2, so there's one, there's two of them down here, and then there's each one of the uh, regions. So those data sets provide the, the backbone between when we go out there on seasonal cruises. So many of you have seen these maps before, but this is, I just want to, this is a composite, and this is just of 10 years. This came out in our SOAR paper, but as I mentioned, showed to you earlier, there's four decades of, of data that we're starting to, to evaluate and, and track in there. Uh, it increases along a, a gradient from south to the Chirikov to the southern Chukchi. A lot of carbon is dumped down to the, the base there. And then a lot of these currents are actually heading into Russia. They come out, come through central channel, they swing back, and they make a deposition up here. Most of this production up here is occurring in, in July, whereas the production here is occurring in April. So you see that latitudinal jump. On the right-hand side, you can see the rich. This is, these are oxygen uptake, and we use these as an indicator of carbon supply. So particularly right in this region, south and north of Bering Strait, and then you'll notice it starts to, you just get a little indication when we've worked our Russian colleagues where that water mass goes. And then we have some of that deposition going up in the Northeast Chukchi Sea and out through Barrow Canyon. So I want to track you through, uh, this is DBO1. This is the longest time series we have, nearly 30 years. Uh, there are three main bivalve species that these threatened ducks feed on. This is their population here. And we work with our colleagues at USGS when they were out on cruises, and they have seen this shift between the 90s to 1996 here, and actually a, a reduction and actually a little bit of movement to the northeast. We are seeing a similar more northern movement of the centroid of the hotspots, and I will show you that. We do have an area that goes below 1 omega, because uh, a lot of that, this becomes capped off in the spring. And so you've got sediment respiration going on here, so a lot of recycling of carbon. Uh, and this is some of the findings from our, our NOAA colleagues here. The other thing is that this cold pool, it, it stays below zero degrees Celsius. So when you see the next couple of photos, you'll start seeing that very low cold water. What is interesting is that you start warming it as you go north, but by the time you catch up, to, when you get up to the northeast check, you see you're back to this cold water because the ice is just leaving when we're getting up there. So we have a compare and contrast between the south and the north. So one of the things we're finding is this motion of a northward direction of this core. This is the biomass. This is the rich anadir water. This is the type of animals that are out there. And the ducks are feeding where the ice is open up. So if they're over this rich area, they can feed. They lose energy if they sit in the water. If they sit on the ice, they don't lose as much energy. And then they can use that as a resting site and dive. But what happened with the movement of ice around here, they're sometimes they're moving over into areas of less primary production. One of the things that we're seeing for these time series on these five core sites that were uh, embedded within process studies is a change of, from one species that the birds like to another species that's more like eating uh, vegetables. Uh, it's less than their, they get less carbon for their bite. And the only areas that we're seeing an increase are in our northern part of that bullet. So the centroid has, has moved north on that, and we're relating that to change the current patterns. This is a deposition. So this is the 80s, the 90s, and 2000s, and we're seeing actually a, a fining of the sediments, and species build their communities depending on the sediment type. And so one of the things, not only are they getting hit with, it appears to be reduced carbon export in this area to the uh, south, but also that's fining, so the the type of clams that these birds get the most energy from are actually, uh, their populations are, are, are further north in that region. And we are having tracked this uh, area. We have put pre and post from 1980s to 2013. And I don't have them all up here, but this is the period of from 2009 to 2000, 2008 to 2009. These three areas that our time series have moved from these clams to polychaetes, and polychaetes are not what these diving sea ducks eat. And so, in fact, that's, it feeds into this higher area in the north, less in the south that we're seeing in this region. And this is the area which these birds are, 
or, um, or spending their time. So three sites out of our five have changed uh, into uh, polykeys. And what I want to show you here is just a little bit, take you through tracking of it. This is just from our recent cruise that we got off of. And we have a, a drop camera. And what you're going to get close down to is a lot of brittle stars. This is 10 centimeters between these two lasers. But a lot of fine particulates on the bottom. And embedded in this, the sediments are the infauna, some of the data that I showed you. But we see a lot of the, you can see actually a lot as it goes up and down, a lot of the marine snow type uh, uh, of uh, carbon that is in this, what we call the Chukchi subway. There's a, a layer that heads from the northern Bering Sea north that has a, a lot of organic matter in it and phytodetritus. So if you move northward, this is the footprint we're seeing for these amphipods. These are these guys here. The California gray whale migrates up to the northern Bering Sea and now all the way up to Barrow to feed on amphipods or large concentrations of crustaceans. So we've seen them eat large concentrations of even cumaceans. They will eat euphosites. Uh, but when they have these amphipods, they go down and they feed off the bottom here. And what you're seeing is this contraction that's happened over since the 70s. Uh, these are biomass, so it's actually, a no once again, we're seeing a northward direction. And I would just point out, we're getting these polychaetes to come in. So a lot of this current coming through, there's a deposition of material. These guys are happy here, but they're not what these, uh, the gray whales are going after. It's what the sculpins are, are, are starting to take advantage of. And so you can make at least actually see these. So what, what, what was interesting about this one, and this I wanted to point, this is actually where there's amphipods, and, it's, and if you could stop. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's hard to see the little guy, little amphipods when you're. What I wanted to point out was that you're starting to see suspension animals here, which were in our previous camera. There were not as many, see the bright, Orange are the sea anemones, but these are string bryozoans. We normally get those in Bering Strait and in Barrow Canyon where there's faster current. So the colonial animals, and they're actually filtering a lot of the material that's heading north through the system. This is something that we haven't seen uh, in the past, like I said, in this region. But there's a lot of fine material that's in here that are providing uh, the base for the, for the infaunal animals. This one I would like to show you because this is where it has changed. These are those tube dwelling polychaetes. So this used to be a, a major area that we would have gray whales feeding. The tubes are actually like the size of a cigar tube. And some, if you, uh, inside of them, they have their heads and they, and they actually filter feed and deposit feed. But one of the things you're seeing with the lighter material here is that fresh phytodetritus. This is a 30 meter station. And you can, it settles down quite quickly. And now you can see the tubes. But this is a popular an area where you have these sculpin fish that are in this region. So as you move through Bering Strait and move into this, this high deposition zone here, this is one of our major footprints that we've had the uh, decadal time series. These are some of the dominant animals from clams to amphipods, marine uh, worms, and cypunculids, and sea cucumbers. And so these are, for, these are deposit feeders that are in the region. And just south uh, north of Bering Strait, when I started this time series back in the 80s, this is what Sam Stoker said was a really high clam biomass. I have kept it because it wasn't clams by the time we started in the 80s. It had all become these sand dollars. This is at the interface now between the Alaska coastal water and the rich offshore anadir water. That, and so this is now almost shell to shell on all of these uh, uh, organisms here. And I would just point out that the, the high suspended load that you're seeing in the bottom boundary current layer here, but you just go through this region and it's primarily uh, all sand dollars and there's very little in the infauna. So this is not a region that is very, uh, is utilized by the, uh, many of the marine organisms uh, in the region, the higher trophic organisms. 
But when you actually go to the, this is the hot spot area that you have, um, and you're starting to see the clams. These are shuck clams. So this is an area we have actually have uh, walruses feeding. We've got uh, sea stars coming in. But I would notice on some of these figures you're going to see there's more. We're actually seeing more of the smaller fish in this region. And I think it. Uh, anytime you see something kind of puff up, there's one. And they're small fish. You know, they're not ready for for prime times autumn trawling but they are uh, of an important part of, of the system for some of these trophic organisms. But this is the first time we've seen them about every, every 15 seconds, these fish on the bottom. And also the uh, apelio crabs, which are the snow crab. Right now the U.S. has a ban on any fishing north of Bering Strait. And the size of these organisms are too small for commercial fisheries, but there is an interest of future as the sea ice retreats and the potential for that as a as a fishing opportunity. So within this uh, time series, once again, we, see we have this changing deposition pattern going over the three decades. Uh, decline, except for this hot spot region where we're seeing variability. But this is the, this is the clam populations that we're having the uh, walruses feeding on. Bearded seals are feeding on this region. But even those are starting, even though extremely high, these are like these are in the 100 grams carbon per meter squared. That's about 4,000 grams wet weight. These are huge for, for Arctic systems. And so they're an important part of the prey direction. But this is the third most uh, region we're actually seeing the northward progression. So if you grid these out as just a pre and post when we started seeing major changes in sea ice retreat in 2005, we are at the color boxes that are more the hot colors are where there's more uh, higher biomass. The coal colors are where those time series have been de declining. And you can see this in one, two, and three, particularly, uh, where you've had the, they're about a 10 to 15 nautical mile increase. And these are related to where we have enhanced deposition zones, but it's further to the north. Our time series are not able to, they were just starting a decade ago, so it's not yet able to, to look at that. So we're looking at the mechanistic reasons uh, and, and trying to do some modeling on these time series data for uh, evaluating the, the spatial trends. So if you move up into the northeast Chukchi Sea, this was where uh, shale oil and gas was in this region, so there were a multitude of both academic and government uh, studies going on. Big clam area, this is where the walruses have a hot spot on the Hanna Shoal, and the oil development was in this region planned for here. And if you probably have seen in various news articles is that when the ice pulls back quickly, they're coming to shore in the tens and 20,000s here and in Russia. What we've done with working with our uh, U.S. Coast Guard and uh, U.S. GS and tagging is they have to use a lot more energy. They go out for two weeks now to get out here to feed and come back. That means they have to spend that energy. Would normally all these polar animals like to sit on the ice and just ride it north like an escalator. So the energy use is greater for, and that's one of the, the, the changes that are going on because right now we don't have enough time series to say what's happening with the feeding base for this, but we do know that the upper trophics are still are tracking that for feeding, but are spending more energy just like the eiders are having to do uh, south of St. Lawrence Island. So I would just point this one here because what is interesting is as we start going north, as you can start, so this is in the northeast Chukchi Sea. Once again, we have the, the brittle stars in here. But what you're seeing is a quite large suspension feeders. You'll start seeing some basket stars here, some anemones. Um, these are indication of the rapid the current regimes that are going on there. And so quite a few of these organisms, these are actually a sea cucumbers that have adapted, and they have their uh, feeding appendages out. But you can really see the, the biomass on the surface is actually quite high compared to what we have inside the, um, in, inside the sediments. And then the final I'd like to just show you before I conclude is this is up in Barrow Canyon area. And then although constrained, in the part of the canyon, you can see the, just visually see the biodiversity. This is the biodiversity hot spot in the upper part of Vero Canyon. And all inside that mud, which you really, but you can see little holes here are mussels. 
So a lot of muscles feeding on the suspension, uh, suspended carbon is being transported down on the canyon. Once again, a lot of these brittle stars, a lot of basket stars of suspension feeding, and you can see a lot of the material in the, in the overlying water column. So I just wanted to conclude is that we are starting to see these ecological shifts. And this is just a schematic of the expectation like I started at the, the beginning. We are actually seeing some of this with the walruses, the impact that uh, the fact the sea ice is retreating earlier. They're having, uh, they have less uh, space. They need that for habitat. And then the, uh, the hypothesis that we're comparing is the fact that you have these high benthic system here reduced here, you'll have more fish coming into the system and more water column baleen feeders in the water column and less of them feeding on the underlying benthos. So in conclusion, um, there is a need for uh, spatial temple scales to look at the ecological shifts. Time series required you, you know, to look and to go back and evaluate on the same places. Uh, we take advantage of our multiple ship operations and uh, both process cruises and time series as part of our observing system. Uh, there needs to be song time series analyses for various components to, to, to weed out the, what the exact mechanisms are and then try to model what the impact will be with changing um, scenarios. Uh, we are seeing the shifting uh, in each one of the three lower ones that are most influenced by the Pacific water inflow. And as we said, these are associated with benthophores. Uh, Sumor was on this cruise we just got off on Saturday. And it was the first time we've gone through north of St. Lawrence Island without a gray whale. And the gray whales were, were north, usually see one or two feeding. And then this is the area we're seeing that contraction. So a lot of these animals are taking their time to go northward and are feeding in the areas. But then they become depth limited if they're, they're benthic feeders. So with that. I want to thank you uh, and to thank the uh, colleagues who are involved and the funding agencies. Okay. So Jackie, two questions. Um, the first one is, you, you can't go to a pelagic ecosystem on that shelf, right? It's only 50 meters deep. So where, where do you see that? evolution towards the pelagic system happening? Because well, it's all dropping there, right? It's, it's in the benthos. It is, it is dropping there. I think what you have there with that is, is uh, simplicity. This new model that we're working on the Sioux is the pulsing, uh, uh, pulsing model. Some of that will become less. For example, south of St. Lawrence Island, it gets capped off and the, most of the carbon is being consumed in the upper water column. So there's nothing more getting. So if it's, if it's limited in the spring, that's all they're going to get for the rest of the year south. Now, north, I think south and north of St. Lawrence, uh, uh, Bering Strait, you will still have benthic populations, but we're seeing declines into those areas. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is the fact that that carbon is just moving northward. Then you may have more of a benthic population, but it's up in, a, in the central. Right now, there's nothing in that central part of the northeast check you see. So I think, yes, you will still have benthic populations in shallow, but I don't think you necessarily will, in the extreme, have them at the level that we had in the past. Okay, so the other question is earlier today we heard uh, that flow through the Bering Strait was increased significantly. Right. Presumably that's a lot of anadir water. And then when it, when it was a lower flow, it, you know, a lot of the nu nutrients would pass through that system unused because they're deep, you know. So is there, you didn't mention change in productivity associated with the change in flow, associated with the change in flux of nutrients. Right. and how that would impact all of what you're seeing. I'm just curious about right. that. Right. And well, two things. I think what's funny is that, in fact, it's the Anadir, the Alaska coastal water and that fresher flow that's coming in with more rivering input that's moving the Anadir over onto the Russian side more. That's having an impact on where that rich organic carbon is going to settle out. And I think that plays a role in that. The other thing is that as it goes through Bering Strait and increases in its velocity, it's going to hold more sediments in it. And so just by natural deposition, it's going to be further north than, than it was. So this is interplay between fresher water coming in the Alaska coastal water and where that anadir water is going. And so a lot of that carbon may actually end up coming to the northeast when it swings back eastward. Oh, and I would just say for primary productivity, we did this synthesis effort. The problem with primary production, you got to be there to, to track change. So you'll see these things where 
things are declining. But if you only go and measure in September, you, the phenology, I think the phenology is changing, but the, the big, big bloom is in the spring. So you, if you did the synthesis, it was very hard to, to, to come up with the conclusion that production has gotten higher or production has gotten lower, because none of the stations were ever occupied at the same for primary production. Um, this is Holly Muller. I'm, I'm here at Hui. Uh, thanks, Jackie, for a really nice illustration of the value of these time series for looking at shifts in these communities. Um, I have a more conceptual question for you. Um, a lot of the explanations we've heard today are really grounded in sort of bottom-up controls on community structure mm -hmm. and working from productivity up to the higher trophic levels. Do you think that there's potential for some top-down feedbacks or competition effects among some of these organisms that are then going to get these communities stuck, if you will, in particular states? That's a, that's a good point. I mean, we, we talk about bottom-up all the time, you know, that it's driven by the hydrographic forcing. I think if you were, for example, those walruses that have to feed in that area, they need it, there, I think there could be a top-down effect because they can only go so far. These animals, we've seen them back in the 2004 when there was this, uh, when we started to see these changes, the babies were all off in 2000, nine or 10 of them were out in 2,000 meters. So they were dead in carbon packages, just like zooplankton are dead in really, because they don't diurnally migrate. They pass through that system, the ones from the Pacific. So I think there's a, there has not been enough uh, studies to, to, to push in the top down part of it, but it's always brought up in a conceptual model that they can actually be a driver. Thank you very much, Jackie. We're going to have Thank to move you. on. Uh, there you go. Thanks.